Okay. There we go. All right. Well, welcome back. I was telling Rachel before everybody logged on that uh, I am down at Long Creek Resort on Table Rock Lake. I, I have to, had to pull the shades because uh, the sun was blaring in and making me whitewashed, but uh, it's absolutely a gorgeous thing. We're down here for a few days, and as she mentioned, I'm celebrating my 75th birthday, so uh, 15 more years, and I'll be 90. That's my goal. I uh, hope I make it. Uh, so we've been talking about Ozark's history, and the last three weeks, we've primarily been talking about the geography of the Ozarks, getting the lay of the land, so to say, and I think we've Pretty well done that now. So we're actually going to start talking today about some of the first inhabitants, those people that first came here, uh, the prehistoric Indian cultures, those Indian cultures of which we have archaeological remains, of which we have a lot of, uh, you know, evidence of. But it's kind of hard to pinpoint. If if you were with me when I first started my ancient history. Uh, programs a long time ago, I told you that looking at prehistory is kind of looking at a fog bank. You can see images of things, but it's really hard to see a clear-cut image of what you're looking at. And that's kind of like the Indians of the Ozarks in the prehistoric times. We have a good idea about what they were like, but be honest about it, uh, those things change as we find new evidence. So, as always, I start out with a famous Ozarker. Now, you know, I bet a lot of you are going to know who this guy is. And on top of that, if you look at his shirt, it kind of gives it away. Uh, of course, this is, uh, you know, a very famous man from Springfield, Missouri, Johnny Morse, the uh, founder, owner of Bass Pro Shops and Cabela World, Outdoor World now, and uh, has... Uh, buildings and, and stores all over the United States. But the mothership, the original Bass Pro Shop is in Springfield, Missouri, and that's where he still resides, or at least part-time. I'm sure he has many houses in many places. What you might not know about Johnny, uh, besides being a billionaire and besides being a great sportsman, is that he is a very important person in terms of preservation of Ozark's history. He absolutely loves the Ozarks, and uh, he has spent a fortune in trying to preserve some of the more beautiful locations of the Ozarks. Uh, uh, he has built a huge resort down at Ridgedale, south of Branson, called Top of the Rock, which has some of the best golf courses in the world, from what I hear. I'm not a golfer, so I'm just taking that from what I hear. But included at Top of the Rock is a place called the uh, Natural History Museum, which uh, he has, uh, the, the ancient Ozarks Ancient Natural History Museum. And he has spent a fortune in, in uh, getting memorabilia and fossils and Indian artifacts and things about the Ozarks. Uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful place to visit if you ever get a chance. Uh, it's one of those hidden secrets that a lot of people don't even know about. And yet it's probably one of the, the premier attractions uh, in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. So enough about Johnny Morris. So rival of Native Americans in the Ozarks. Now, you're probably aware that in the beginning, there were no humans in North and South America. Uh, they had to come here. So how did they get here and when did they come here? Well, the best guess that we have from archaeological evidence is that they came here somewhere about 20 to 12,000 BC. So, you know, maybe 22,000 to 14,000 years ago, humans entered into North America. We're pretty sure how they got here. They probably came in across the land bridge that, that connected North America with Asia. That thing is called Beringia. And what happened was as the world froze over with the last ice age, the oceans compacted and a lot of land appeared. And there was a land bridge that connected North America up around Alaska and Asia. And as a result, uh, some of these ancient migratory animals uh, crossed over 
and hunters presumably crossed over after them uh, on their trail and followed them all over North and, and populated North and South America. That's, that's the general consensus theory about how North and South America got uh, populated. Now these glaciers were huge. Uh, some, some of them were as many as two miles thick. Uh, we're talking 10,000 feet thick. We're talking uh, almost uh, two thirds of the height of the Rocky Mountains. That's how big these glaciers were. Uh, and sea levels dropped anywhere to about 300 feet. So it created this huge land bridge. Fortunately, there were ice-free corridors and that allowed these humans to pretty, pretty rapidly head south after these animals. And when they got here, they stayed. Uh, so here's a map or a, you know, a, somebody's idea of what Beringia would have looked like. Uh, the brown part, of course, is Siberia and Alaska, and the beige part would have been the land bridge. And you can see this is now ocean. This is the Bering Strait between uh, the uh, Bering Sea and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so this was this was all this is all ocean now. But in the, you know at that time it was a it was a land bridge, you know, crossed over that way. Now. When did they get into the Ozarks? And again, this is, you know, there's no clock on the wall that said at this point in time, the Ozarks were populated by human beings. We have to go on archeological evidence. We have to go on scientific conclusions. The best bet is about 10,000 BC, uh, the first humans arrived in the Ozarks. Now, they would not have stayed here. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Uh, they would probably have ventured into the Ozarks and left pretty rapidly. Uh, it would have been more of a transitory place for hunting, but they would not have settled here. Uh, the reason, uh, as I'll show you in a few minutes, is it just wasn't a very hospitable place. Now, there is some evidence that this may have occurred a couple thousand years earlier than originally thought. Like I said, most archaeological evidence uh, pinpoints the uh, humans arriving in the Ozarks about 10,000 BC. Some archaeologists think they're going to have to push that back to about 12,000 BC. Uh, Missouri State University has uh, done a uh, archaeological project up on Truman Lake at something called the Big Eddy archaeological site. And uh, at that site, they have evidence that indicates it may be earlier than they originally thought. It's not been decided yet. But the reason that the uh, humans didn't stay here, to be very honest about it was, folks, it was a pretty scary place. If you would have arrived in the Ozarks 10,000, 12,000 BC, it would not have looked like it done now, does now. It would have been a wetland. It would have been a swamp because what had happened was the glaciers had now melted and the glaciers melted the levels of the water rose and it inundated the lower areas of the ozarks now not all of it obviously uh the mountaintops and the hills uh would have still been dry land but getting from one to the other would have been difficult it would have looked uh some people suggest it looked it looked kind of like the everglades you know and if you've ever been to the Everglades, you know that's not a real hospitable place. On top of that, the Ozarks was home to some really pretty scary creatures 10,000 years ago. Woolly mammoths and mastodons, these huge elephants, something they called a short-faced bear, uh, giant land sloths that weighed up to three tons, 6,000 pounds. Saber-toothed tigers were roaming around there and something called a dire wolf, which was much larger than the typical wolf of this generation. So if you were gonna live in the Ozarks in 10,000 BC, you would have to have been a pretty tough character. Number one, the land was horrible. It was swampy. Number two, you would have had to fought off some of the most ferocious creatures that you would have found any time in North America. Um, so it was not a very hospitable place. And that's why the Ozarks, at least in the beginning, wasn't home to any inhabitants. It was a place they came to to hunt 
and then left uh, and probably went to other areas that were a lot drier and a lot more hospitable. This is the Big Eddy archaeological site up at Truman uh, Dam and Lake. Uh, there is kind of a rush to get this done because um, there is, uh, if they completely inundate the dam, uh, the lake, and uh, turn on some more of the generators that they plan on doing, it's going to inundate this area. So they're trying to rush around trying to get this thing uh, completed, this archaeological site. This is a picture of the Big Oak Tree State Park in southeast Missouri. This is what archaeologists think the lower levels of the Ozarks would have looked like 10,000 BC. Folks, that's, <laughs> you wouldn't want to live there. I can guarantee you what. It's not a place that you would want to have a uh, home for sure. Uh, this is Johnny Morris's Ancient Ozarks Natural History Museum. And uh, like I said, it is just an absolutely fantastic place to visit if you ever get the chance. Uh, if you're a golfer, come to Top of the Rock and golf and then take some time and spend an afternoon going through the ancient Ozarks Natural History Museum. He has fossils of some of these creatures that I just mentioned. He has, um, you know, Indian artifacts tracing the original inhabitants as we're talking about all the way up through the 19th, 20th century. Uh, he just has a lot of Old West memorabilia. It's just a terrific place. Here's one of the fossilized skeletons in the ancient Ozarks Museum. This is one of those ground sloths. Here is an example of a human, and here is what this thing would have looked like. <laughs> I'm, you know, if it's a herbivore, it ate plants, but you still wouldn't want to run into one. I can guarantee you that. Uh, they're big enough that they would have trampled you. And this is uh, one of the skeletal remains of one of these ground sloths that they found in the Ozarks. Uh, this is a skeletal remain at uh, the Museum of a Woolly Mammoth, a Mastodon. And again, um, these were the primary source of what these prehistoric Indians would have been chasing because they would have provided lots of food and lots of uh, things to use to stay alive. This is a skeletal remains, not from the Natural History Museum. This is a skeleton remain of what's called a short-faced bear. Now, it's hard to tell from here, but if you look over here, these are claw marks inside an ice cave, which I'm going to talk to you about here in a second. And evidently, this short-faced bear was trying to reach some kind of critter to get to it. These are 19 feet above the floor, these claw marks. That means that this short-faced bear stretching its arms out at its height could reach 19 feet. That's twice the height of a basketball goal. It, I'm telling you folks, these would not have been any creatures that you would have wanted to have encountered, that's for sure. Um, this is a saber-toothed tiger, and again, it shows you uh, an idea about how big these cats were compared to the modern tiger, uh, quite a bit larger and much more ferocious. Uh, of course, got these huge fangs, and uh, you know, look how big these claws are, feet, and compared to a normal tiger today. And you wouldn't want to encounter a normal tiger, let alone a saber-toothed tiger. Um, this is a dire wolf, um, probably about a quarter size more than a regular timber wolf today. And again, uh, not something that you'd want to run into. And of course, wolves run in packs to begin with. So the bottom line is this, folks. Uh, you would not have wanted to have lived in the Ozarks in 10,000 BC. Uh, a lot of people don't want to live here today, but I can guarantee you what, you really wouldn't have wanted to live here 10,000 BC. It was a bad place. Now, just in the last couple of decades, we are beginning to get a better idea about what it was like uh, at this period of time. Um, in 2001, September 11th, we all know what happened on that date. Uh, there was an excavation crew in Southwest Springfield uh, creating a new road for a new subdivision called River Bluff. And they broke open a cave. And when they did that, they looked down and they realized that they had uh, opened up the, an entrance to something that was pretty important. And by law, they had to stop. 
you know, there, there are certain laws that says when you, uh, you know, encounter situations like artifacts, uh, you know, things like this, uh, you know, fossilized remains, you have to stop and alert the authorities and let somebody come out and check it. And they did. Uh, they came out and checked it. And uh, they said, yeah, you've got something here that we've never seen. Uh, some of the people from Missouri State ended up that they had opened up the entrance to the oldest Ice Age fossil cave in the United States of America. It's called a River Bluff Cave. It's a million years old. I mean, it is just, uh, you know, an unbelievable find uh, for Springfield and the Ozarks. Uh, they've been working at this ever since. They built a small museum at the top of it. Uh, the museum, by the way, is not open to the public. Or, pardon me, the cave is not open to the public. It is so fragile and so important to science that it is not open to the public and probably never will be. Uh, it's, it's one of those caves that just, you know, is that important. Um, they've found claw marks of these short-faced bears. I showed you a picture of that a few minutes ago. Uh, large cats, uh, fossils have been found. They found the fossil remains just recently of a woolly mammoth that had been trying to escape the great Yellowstone volcanic eruption. Uh, you know anything about geology, you know that uh, Yellowstone sits on top of what's called a caldera which is uh, the top part of a volcano. And when it blew many, many thousands, maybe millions of years ago, it almost destroyed North America. And, uh, you know, apparently they found volcanic ash that they can relate back to this Yellowstone eruption. Uh, so it's just an unbelievably important uh, find. Just so happens, I have a short video here, about five minutes, uh, this is the guy that directs his name is Matt Four, and he is uh, kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what's inside the River Bluff Cave. I thought you might enjoy this. I think it's about five minutes long. Right now, we are about 30 feet below the surface of the earth in River Bluff Cave, which is the oldest fossil cave site in North America um, currently and uh, it's it, the fossils in here are about 1.1 million years old and we've got stuff that is probably going to be a little bit older uh, once the dates come back he was discovered september 11th 2001 um and you know like everyone else i was at home watching television um you know kind of just glued to the events the world changing in front of me i didn't realize that the world was going to change below me uh you know in a few minutes i get a phone call uh, hey, Matt, new cave just opened up and you're going to want to come out, take a look at it. I pull up in this parking lot, this gravel parking lot just south of here, and I notice that cold air on my ankles when I got on my truck. And oh, man, you know, this is this is interesting because this must mean it's a big cave. There's a lot of air blown out of this thing. And so I can't wait to get up to the edge. So I, I grab some real quick, you know, some boots on that kind of stuff. And I run up to the the edge of the crater at that time it was this big heap of rock uh, kind of forming a, a half moon shape with the other half of that crater in the rock here in the cave. And I get to the top and I can see the columns that you're seeing behind me, you know, lit up with the sun, which they've never seen the sun before. Um, and man, you know, that that first thought that goes to your head is they're going to want me to go in there, <laughs> you know. I get to explore this. This is terrifyingly wonderful, <laughs> you know, all at the same time. Pressing past this point, no one had been. Um, and so we, we were first people, sort of the, you know, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin of River Bluff Cave. Um, and, and that was special because, you know, a mud floor and you look out in front of you and there are no human footprints. I've been in a lot of new caves. So stepping somewhere that a human has never stepped isn't new to me, but it sure was then. Uh, it was uh, because you look to your left and right and you could see trackways of prehistoric animals in the mud too. And so you had to work your way uh, you know, around those. We didn't want to destroy anything that first day. Um, you know, we saw a lot that first day. We saw claw marks in the walls. We saw trackways of bears and, and bones stick out of, the, out of the walls and on the ground. 
<clears throat> it was uh, an overload. I mean, even think about it right now, it's sensory overload. It's that feeling you get. It's the same feeling I got the first day in here. Two things really got me. It's that feeling of you know, when you're in a site, when you're in a place with a deep, rich, prehistoric history, um, if you don't stand in front of that in awe, there's something wrong with you, I think. You're standing in a cave that the oldest date we have right now is 1.1 million years ago. And some of the lower sediment we have found um, will probably date to 1.2 million. As I said before, you know, time, there's no clock on the wall. I mean, it's just, this cave is just sitting here collecting data with no interest in time, just collecting. And so you have millions of fossils in here, everything from fossilized earthworms to mammoths, you know, preserved in this cave. We have volcanic ash from the last Yellowstone eruption 640,000 years ago, the Lava Creek eruption. That's here. You know, the mammoths that are in the cave are here because that ash during the event pushed them in here. This is the only way they could get fresh air. And they died. Their, their lungs were cut up with the ash. Uh, they succumbed to that, that uh, uh, ingestion of ash. That's all in here. We see bear beds you know, right behind you guys, a few feet are bear beds. The giant short-faced bear, the females raise their young in here. You see the big beds where the mom was. You see the satellite beds where the, where the young were. You have life, you have death, you've got birth, you have everything. Everything happening in North America is being preserved in this cave over time. Um, and it's still doing that. It hasn't stopped just because we're studying it. Uh, it's still, still doing it. And, and that's what makes this cave so important. But a lot of caves, not all, but most caves, are just as important as far as record keepers. And so, yeah, I mean, you've got half a million years of time preserved in this cave. Uh, imagine a, uh, you know, a cathedral or some architecture that's half a million years old. You know, any visitor would be in awe of it, as they should, yeah. Okay, so that gives you an idea about the River Bluff Fossil Cave. Uh, I've never been in it. Uh, I wish someday I could get in it and see it, but again, it's not open to the public and uh, it's pretty hard to get permission to get in it because they don't want to spoil any of the uh, uh, artifacts. Now, eventually, eventually, as the ground dried up and these animals that you know were found in the ancient Ozarks begin to die off with uh, various uh, things happening, Eventually, you begin to have humans that came into the Ozarks and begin to stay at least part time. There's a debate about whether or not they actually uh, lived here full time or if they would come in for long seasons of hunting and then uh, maybe live for several months and then depart. Um, that's still open to debate, but somewhere around 1000 BC, about 3000 years ago, uh, about the same time that David was ruling in Jerusalem, uh, you begin to see the first humans settling, per se, into the Ozarks. They almost always lived in caves. We've given them a name. They're called bluff dwellers. Uh, that is a name that was given by some of the earliest archaeologists and uh, people that studied the Indians of the Ozarks, and it stuck with it. They almost always chose a cave with the southern exposure. Uh, it was almost always near a river or stream. And uh, usually they were able to put up some kind of, the entrance was small enough they could put up animal skins or uh, coverings of some sort to keep them, the elements out during the bad months if they stayed there that long. There were hundreds. There may have been thousands of these bluff dweller caves in the Ozarks at one time or the other. Obviously, most of these are long gone. Uh, the caves aren't necessarily long gone, but the uh, whatever was in them are long gone because people would go in uh, as they found the land and then explored it, and they would go in and search out and 
and maybe bring out uh, these artifacts. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute about some artifacts from a, from an old bluff dweller cave. Um, so again, there's there's some debate about whether or not these bluff dwellers were permanent residents or just temporary residents. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, like I said, there's been hundreds of these found. Uh, they apparently were sophisticated enough that they had at least some simple religious practices. And that's pretty important, folks. Once humans reached a point in their development that they were no longer, and I don't mean to sound crude here, no longer using the remains of dead people as a food source, uh, once they got to the point where they realized that they wanted to preserve this body uh, for the fact that they felt like there was some religious significance to it, that they were going to go somewhere else and bury them, and maybe along with some shells or clothing items or offerings, you reach a pretty important, important point in development of human sophistication. And they reached that point, these bluff dwellers did, you begin to see evidence of burials going on. So that's a pretty important step. Uh, this is a typical, you know, actually it's probably atypical bluff dweller cave. This would have been a really big one. And, uh, but this is a bluff dweller's cave from the Ozarks. And you can see it's got a big rounded entrance and uh, they would have settled in the back. Uh, obviously it would have been very difficult to cover the entrance up here. But uh, they would have lived in the back of this cave and they would have had fires and they would have left remains, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are a couple of really rudimentary artifacts from a bluff dweller's cave. You can see a human tooth here and you can see a bone. Now, I got a story about this picture I want to tell you. My dad was born on top of a bluff at the James River in an old rock house in 1909, uh, right where uh, now Camel Street uh, crosses over, Camel Street Road crosses over uh, the James River uh, going south towards Nixon, Missouri. And as a young kid, he prowled the bluffs. I mean, this was 100 and, you know, 13 years ago. And he would prowl around these bluffs uh, hunting, going down to the river to fish, et cetera. And as a young kid, he would often find caves. And he found a small cave uh, located on this bluff. And he got in there and he found, you know, lots of things, but he took these two things, this, this human tooth and this bone, uh, which I presume is human, I'm not for sure, but I think it is, uh, brought it home, uh, and for whatever reason, my family was, even early on, kind of crazy about taking pictures. That's why we have so many pictures of my family and, and some of the things. And he laid these out, and he took a picture of this. And then he said, I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, it's not right that I've done this. He took the bones back to the cave and reburied them because he realized that he had probably disturbed an Indian cave. Uh, he wouldn't have called it a bluff dwellers cave then. He just would have called it an Indian cave. But folks, there are probably hundreds, thousands of incidents like this where people found remains from caves. Uh, I hope some of them returned them as my dad did, but they may not have, you know. Um, and we know that there are just hundreds and thousands of artifacts that have been taken out of these caves and, and have, some of them have been preserved. Now, this is one of the few rare bluff dweller caves that has pictographs. Uh, the bluff dwellers were not artists and they did not often leave uh, graphic remains, but in this particular cave, they did. And you can see they use some, some red dye of some sort from natural dye and they drew a picture, probably a hunt, you know, that's going on. Not very good, but at least we know it's it's one of the few remains that shows pictographs, uh, ancient drawings from these bluff floors. This is probably the best preserved cave, bluff dweller cave in the Ozarks. It's at Knoll, Missouri. Uh, it was found by a man by the name of Browning 
And those are just some of the artifacts he dug out of that thing. He had, there's a museum there and you can go and you can tour the cave. Uh, it's not a real big cave and it's not, you know, it's not like the River Bluff Cave. It's not got all these fantastic fossilized things uh, that have been destroyed. This would have been about anywhere from a thousand years, uh, thousand BC to about, you know, the birth of Christ. Is these would have been fossil uh, artifact remains from that period of time. Uh, but it's an, it's an excellent place to visit if you want to get an idea about what the bluff dweller remains would have looked like. Uh, so eventually, these bluff dwellers, who originally were hunters and gatherers, people that, you know, they, they hunted animals down, they gathered up berries and, and things as they found them they begin to switch to agriculture. And again, that's a huge step in sophistication. Once you get to the point where you are no longer dependent upon following animals and gathering the natural resources, once you begin to reach a point where you start to plant things, you can become sedentary. That's when you begin to see villages arise. That's when you begin to see, you know, what leads ultimately to civilization. And somewhere towards the end of the bluff dwellers time in the Ozarks, which would have been around the time of the birth of Jesus, um, they begin to switch to agriculture. Uh, they begin, you know, they still hunted, uh, they still gathered, uh, they gathered fruits and nuts and seeds, they hunted deer, bison, bear, other small animals, they fished, they looked for turtles. Uh, you know, they, they would have done that. By the way, they would not have had the bow and arrow. We have absolutely no evidence that these bluff dwellers had reached a point where they had developed the bow and arrow. That would come quite a bit later from other civilizations or cultures. Uh, their primary weapon would have been a spear, and they would have used what was called an atlatl. An atlatl is a spear thrower. And what it is, it's a long piece of wood with a notch on the end, and you would fit a spear into that notch, and it would actually extend their arms out to the point where you could throw a spear like twice to three times the normal length you would be able to throw a spear with a lot more force. And the result was that you wouldn't have to get so close to these animals. Uh, you didn't want to get any closer to a bison or a bear than you had to, trust me. Um, and so they developed this atlatl. And again, that was a pretty common artifact throughout world history. Uh, you look back at, at cultures that were developing uh, and almost all of them developed the atlatl. But they did not have the bow and arrow. They never developed that. There is real evidence that they began to domesticate first the wild turkey, that would probably been the first thing that they domesticated. And eventually they would have domesticated the wild dog. Uh, they, would have, they would have probably had these. We have clear evidence that these uh, were used as, as food source as well as the dog in the case for hunting sources. And then they begin to plant. They probably, what happened was that they probably uh, gathered food and threw out the seeds and the next year, they noticed that where they thrown the seeds, that pumpkins began to grow. And they thought, hmm, well, guess what? If I plant those seeds, I don't have to go looking for pumpkins. I can have them right here. And that's exactly what happened. They began to grow corn, which was the primary thing that they wanted to grow. Beans, squash, pumpkins, sunflowers. All of these were natural occurring crops or plants inside the Ozarks at this time. And we see clear evidence of where they begin to plant these and where they begin to harvest them. Uh, in order to store these things, they begin to develop the art of basket weaving and the bluff dwellers became highly developed basket weavers. Uh, they would use reeds or tree bark and they would develop these baskets to keep their produce and to keep uh, their food sources in it and store it. Uh, as well as when they would dry their fish or dry their meat, they would store them in these baskets. 
They never developed pottery. Again, that would come a little bit later. They never did develop the art of pottery, uh, being able to make more permanent things. Uh, so here's some of the things that shows us bluff willing farming that came from the bluff willers. These are corn cobs is what they are. And these have been found in the back of uh, you know, uh, the bluff villa caves in the dirt. And we know from how they've been done that they you know, were grown. There's enough of them there they would not have been able to gather them up. These are sunflowers. Uh, and so they developed, they, you know, they grew sunflowers for the seeds. This would have been a rudimentary plow that they had developed. This was an artifact from one of these bluff filler caves where they were able to dig the ground. Uh, and you can see it's basically just a piece of wood with a hole in it. And they would have uh, fashioned uh, a rock, a flint rock into a, uh, you know, a plowshare and forced it up in there and then taken a piece of wood here and notched it in to hold it. And they would use this to plow the ground up. Uh, they would not have used an animal to do this. They, didn't, they hadn't reached that point of sophistication yet. Uh, and then you have a basket. This is one of the better replicas, or rep, not a replica, a better example, an artifact of a basket that's been found in a Bluff Willers cave. You can see it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I mean, think about it, folks. This thing's 2,000 years old. And, uh, you know, they have found this. They've been able to, you know, store it. And you can see that it was used to, to gather crops uh, and store food sources and things like this. So they were, they had reached a point in their life where they were beginning to be more of a sedentary agricultural group of people. Unfortunately, it didn't last. The bluff dwellers pretty suddenly disappear. All evidence of them disappear pretty shortly after approximately the time of the birth of Jesus, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, we see that all of a sudden it's gone. And uh, the bluff dwellers just disappear. Now, what happened to them? Well, that's one of the great mysteries of the Ozarks, nobody really knows for sure. There's there's some pretty good ideas. Um, you know, probably they fell victim to marauding bands of other tribes. As you're going to find out next week, surrounding the Ozarks were many more sophisticated Indians that were building cultures that bordered on civilizations. Uh, and it's probably what happened was they probably started using the Ozarks as a trading ground, as a hunting ground, and they probably came into conflict with these bluff willers, and the bluff willers just absolutely were not able to uh, survive because these other Indian groups, as we're going to find out next week, belong to something called the Woodland Hopewell tradition, and they were much more sophisticated. In fact, the case, they were so sophisticated, they bordered on civilization. Uh, they didn't reach that level, but they were almost there. You know? So they would have been much more sophisticated than the bluff dwellers. There's also the possibility that they fell victim to a pandemic. We all know what a pandemic is by now. Um, so the bluff dwellers, you know, could have encountered a new disease, possibly a combination of both. You know, uh, this is not unusual. Again, this is something that happened pretty regular in ancient history, would be that a group of people fell victim to a disease they had never encountered before, or they fell victim to a new group of people that were more sophisticated. So this would have been probably what happened to them. Uh, as I said, the Bluff Willers, while they were living this period of time, about 1000 BC to about the time of birth of Christ in the Ozarks, uh, they they were still pretty primitive. They were archaic Indians. That's what they're called. Uh, surrounding the Ozarks in areas like up around St. Louis today at an area called Cahokia, uh, down in the south at a place called Spiro, Oklahoma, uh, up into Kansas around Kansas City, uh, down south around the Memphis area, 
there began to be huge developments of Indian cultures that were just unbelievably more sophisticated than the archaic Indians of the Ozarks. That's what we're going to talk about next week, this woodland Hopewell tradition. Now, you people that are coming to me and listening to me from Ohio, you're going to be particularly interested in this because the woodland Hopewell tradition has many of its roots uh, in Ohio. And uh, there's uh, quite a bit of connection between the Ohio Hopewell traditions and the ones in the Ozarks. So that's what we're going to talk about next week, the Woodland Hopewell Mississippian tradition. And we will see how the Indian cultures developed into almost civilization. Didn't quite get there, uh, but came so close to being a civilization in the truest sense of the word, just like the civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia and the Indus River Valley and the uh, Yellow River Valley of China, and to some degree, the civilizations down in Mexico. Came pretty close. Didn't quite get there, but almost. So that's enough for the day. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned a little bit about something and uh, come back next week and we will learn about the Woodland Mississippian tradition, which definitely had influence upon the early Ozarks. Can I tell you something, Tony? Yes. <laughs> uh, the Bluff Dwellers Cave was the very first cave I ever went into and I was a little girl. And uh, you know how they always turn off the lights to let you see how dark it is? And I said, oh, daddy, it's really dark in here. And I grabbed onto a man's hand. And then when we came out, it wasn't my daddy. <laughs> I had grabbed somebody else's hand. <laughs> and the man was so nice. He said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, OK, now that's quite the story. <laughs> <laughs> they always turn off the lights in a cage and let you see how dark it is without uh, you know, it it's pretty dark in some of those caves. If you ever, I don't know if you've ever been to Marvel Cave in, in Branson, but they do that. They take you uh -huh. down about 700 feet. And then when you reach a point, they turn the lights off and you can't see your hand. No, it, your it's black, black, black in there. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you can. You can. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And uh, next week, we'll see if we can learn some more. Okay. We really are enjoying it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for spending your birthday with us a little bit. Happy yes, birthday. Happy. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. You know, I wouldn't have missed it for the life. I told my family, I said, I've got to, I've got to do my job here. So. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. We yes, hope you have sir. a good rest of your trip and everybody has a great day. Okay. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.